Gears One came out and uh, it hit tremendously large for us. Uh, we we were hoping it would be big. Uh, we were hoping that the reviews would be great. We were hoping we'd sell a few copies, and uh, our expectations were just completely blown away. You make a game, and you think, "Well, we're making a really good game. We love to play this game. We can't stop playing. We love it. We think it's great." But it's really the fans who decide how successful you're going to be. And we were extremely fortunate. We caught the right wave, and people love the game, and we got great review scores. And you can't ask for anything better than that. We were hoping for the best, and. Um you know, kind of towards the end of the project, we were just getting really giddy and excited, and we really hoped that other people would feel the same way. I wasn't terribly surprised with the success of Gears of War, only because of how fun it was to play as we were making it. Um, it was more of a surprise that we actually finished it on time and at such a high level because it was such a tight crunch that summer finishing the game up, but we knew we had something special there. I think in, in gaming, it seems like it's a roll of the dice whether something's going to be good or not, but, but once I came here to Epic and, and saw the talent and saw the effort and the attitude and, and the love people put into what they were doing, you know, in, in a sense I wasn't really surprised. I mean, everyone, everyone's here to, to do their best and put their best into their work and, and it really shows and I think it showed in, in Gears 1. With Gears 1 we could try a bunch of new stuff. People didn't have expectations about what what does a shotgun do, etc. But with Gears 2 everything you change now has a following and people are far more religious about you know their preferences with these things as they've been exposed to them for far longer. With Gears 2 yeah, there's a pressure to, to deliver a new experience for uh, fans that are out there that you want to keep them happy and you want to keep them engaged. But at the same time, you kind of know you have the core mechanic figured out. You kind of know that at the end of the day, your game is going to be fun. Um, the question is, can you just deliver that new and exciting part that will keep people engaged? The first Gears uh, was very much kind of a summer blockbuster type of a narrative, and the, the sequel is, of course, uh, that kind of roller coaster ride. But at the same time, we're, we're digging in a little bit deeper on the story to really get to know who these guys are in Delta Squad. We wanted to open the game kind of with a recap as far as just reminding the player of what's at stake, what the situation is with the world, and uh, the, we have the, the character of Chairman Prescott who's delivering this kind of rousing speech to all the Coalition soldiers, the Stranded are listening in on it. War is all we know. In the past, we fought for emulsion, we fought for country, we fought for freedom. But all that changed after E-Day. There are certain elements of the speech that were really important to me to convey, because I felt like, you know, the thing that people don't tend to do is they don't tend to do the math. Right, is that we talked about the Pendulum Wars is a 79 year war. That at the point of the Gears 2 starting, they've been fighting the Locust for 15 years now. Right, so now we're talking about 94 years of conflict. That's essentially an entire generation that has never known peace. That if you can imagine a world, not like a World War I, World War II, we're talking about a planetary war that has gone on for like 94 years essentially. So this, this is a, what, what kind of culture is that? What kind of life is that where you're expected to go into the army? And it's all that kind of backstory that I don't think people had, a frame of reference they didn't have, and that's what I really wanted to come out of the speech, is this you notion of, hey, all the time. yeah, you know, and the fact, that just that that's going on, that people can speak to, that we've never known a time of peace, I think is, is a really important aspect of the, of the backstory of the world. Originally, we did talk about, you know, doing Hoffman delivering the speech, and that didn't really quite work out, and I think that's what gave us a lot of this, you know, whole iterative of process on it, and when we came up on the, the character of the chairman, which is something we'd cycled on, but hadn't decided on, once we had him, and it took a minute to cast the right person. Once we had that in place, things got considerably smoother. It's interesting to see more about how the, the leadership structure of the coalition is kind of built, as well as the, how the locust leadership pans out, and to kind of see these layers of, you know, what's really going on in this war, and who's responsible, and who's leading the people. Right away, these guys came with, uh, as I came onto the story, was the, the Maria. Uh, and I think has become kind of the anchor uh, in a lot of ways for the human part of the story because we have this big macro story, this large, larger war that's going on with humanity and the locust. But then I think it's really great to have this anchor with Maria's story and inevitably there's some dark parts to that. Dumb. There's nothing darker than a man finding his, his significant other completely incapacitated and then having to do the only thing he can. And uh, it's, it's really heavy stuff. And, and watching the scene to this day still gives me chills. Well, and it's interesting because as we shoot this, we have no idea what really everyone's reaction is going to be to it. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see because mm -hmm. I, I know it's going to be something that's going to be talked about. It's not something you see 
hell even in any media very often, especially visual media, yeah. let alone um, a game. You know, having the, the sort of the best friend role go through the deeper moment because it's, it's kind of more interesting for the player to witness it as opposed to you can't push that on, you know, uh, onto the player to say, yeah, okay, you this to, is your you experience. You miss your wife, don't you? you yeah. Like, really? What? And it's easier to make him be a witness, and at the same time, it is nicer to to take a second, you know, pseudo secondary character like Dom, and and sort of raise their, their importance in the story is really I thought was really cool too. Writing for this medium is extremely tricky. We're still feeling out the ways that we can create a world, and it's not like a linear medium like television or film where you just go and shoot, and like, okay, here's the 100-page script, and you're done. Uh, you have to consider how is this line being delivered? Are the characters walking around in the world? Is it a cutscene? Is it like a piece of dialogue over a loudspeaker? And we have so many different uh, colors in our palette with which to paint the narrative, and uh, there's not a lot of people in the world that can uh, write for this medium. You know, games are an art form, something that we're all proud of, that we've put a lot of time into, that. Uh, it, it's it's that time I think to where things that can really a story in a game can last the test of time. I think you know you have a lot of games from a Half Life Two to a Bioshock most recently that you know people talk about it. I mean when the story affects people. We have about uh, a little over forty cinematics that we're working on that we've gone through the entire process of uh, of mocapping and uh, preparing and uh, getting together for uh, Gears Two. Once we get a script, we'll look over the script, uh, decide how we can make this work in a scene. And then once we've kind of narrowed it down, um, they'll usually go and have the voice actors record, record the audio. Cole, Baird, stay here and guard the centaur. Dom, you come with me. Marcus is a badass sergeant. Uh, we find out that um, he's been basically a soldier uh, that was uh, put in prison for whatever he did, and uh, and he's back out now as a, as, a, as a gear again because I need him. What's interesting about uh, building on this character, you know, from the first game to the second game, it, it just, it's just different because we just see him growing. We see their relationship between him, himself and, and Dom and, and, and Cole and Baird, everybody, you know, everybody in the crew that, you know, you didn't really get to see before. And it's just a, it's a little bit more... Uh, intricate a plot line you know there's a lot a lot of different stuff going on and i think emotionally for the character it's a lot it's a lot more hang in there rook we'll be there soon let's go find carmine when you build a character it's it's got it's got you know it's got to come from the ground up so it's you know there's all sorts of things that come together so yeah it's the description it's the picture it's the you know it's the attitude it's just like oh okay and you just piece it all together and you kind of throw it together and it's funny because um i had the feeling you're going to ask me about um was there any other voice that I tried with it? And really, there there wasn't. There wasn't. It just seemed like this guy needed to be... That was it. Right here. You know, boom. Taking care of business. And that's just, that's just kind of where I went with it. Dominic Santiago is Marcus Phoenix's best friend and ally. And uh, he's one of the protagonists in Gears of War and Gears of War 2. He uh, has got a lot of experience in the field fighting uh, the Locusts. And... Uh, He's a kick-ass guy. The voice really came from making it all really real. The, the idea that, you know, you could die at any moment, that when there's battle, it's it's really real. And, and you know, not not really going over the top, but making sure that it, you make it a sincere uh, situation, that you really are in combat, that you really are caring about your friend, that you've got... The, if, you're, if the stakes are high in the scene, that they really are high, that, you know, you can hear that in the voice. Ah! God damn it! He's got so many personal, not demons, but things that are going on in his, in his, in his head that he doesn't necessarily share with Marcus or share with the other characters. And, uh, for example, in Gears of War 2, uh, there's the very, very real thing with Maria that uh, he's been searching uh, one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, why he's been at it and fighting and uh, going through all this is that he's got a missing wife, a loved one. I'll catch up with you in a sec, Marcus. All right? Yeah. Whatever you need. Guys, let's go. It was really different to work uh, with John on Gears of War 2. The material only stands to benefit from having two actors working really hard at having chemistry and that dynamic that's so, you know, visceral. You can feel it. You, you know that, that these guys are, you know, exchanging words, uh, either arguing or going into battle together. Uh, I think that it's, it, you can hear it in the sessions. Augustus Cole is, uh, he's a soldier. 
in the game who is uh, ex thrash ball player. You know, what we know today is is football, and uh, he's just rough and tough, and he's cocky, he's arrogant, he's confident, smart, he's all everything rolled into one. He's just a badass soldier, and he's a team player. I just try to try to just tap into what that person would sound like. So I tried different voices. And uh, and then I end up selling on like just real graspy, deep. You know, he's kind of excited. You know, I'm the cold train, baby. You know. Oh yeah, baby, this train is running on time. The writing uh, in Gears of War is just incredible. They actually every character has his own identity, and I think it's great. Cole has his own. You know, he has his own way of you know laying it out there. And Marcus, and, and you know, I, I think that the writing, you know, supports the the acting. It all comes together. That's why we're number one. You know, it would be great if, if fans, uh, you know, after you know playing the game and ex you know exhausting themselves in this game, it would be great if they actually felt like, you know, they accomplished something. That they were really a part of the game. That that they're emotionally struck by some of the events and the things that are happening, just like they would be if they were actually in the game. Baird is, you know, oftentimes regarded as the sort of the comedy element, but he really is a voice of reason and really, you know, like all the other characters, really detests being in this hell and is very vocal about it. The rhythm, I just imagine him just being very quick-witted and just thinking about, like, what, what are we going to do? Oh, that's great. Oh, we have to go in. Oh, really? We got to go in. That's just, that's just fantastic. Great. All right, what are you going to do? You know, that kind of thing. There we go. One muzzled queen. Not you, her. You were great. I loved your, your speech there, especially with the bitch-ass stuff. Very good, very enlightening. Acting in a video game, on one end, it's the basic acting uh, skills that you are required to do on stage or on film. What's different in a video game is you have many outcomes. So instead of a regular script, you're playing ten different endings. More, maybe. And so... You have to really know that character very well. How will he be when he's about to die? How is he killing? How is he running away? How is he relaxed? And you have to have all these parts of him very complete. So then the player, who's as integral to it as I am, uh, you know, is going to elicit different responses from me. So what's fun for me uh, is having players, you know, game players, gamers come to me and say, hey, you know, you were, uh, we, you know, played Gears of War with you all weekend. You were a real a hole or you were a real jerk, you know, and then someone else can come to me and say, wow, you were funny. That was really funny. And I realized it all depended on how they played and how they interacted with me. With the deeper storyline, there's much more opportunity for a, a variety of different musical styles and so obviously we have the action and we have the battle we have the chase but we also have some somber moments some desperate moments some emotional moments so even a couple of romantic moments <sighs> We recorded the score at Skywalker Ranch out in California, and it was done in two different sessions. The first session was recording the, um, the orchestra, which is essentially a big string section, big brass and woodwind section together. And then the second day was recording all of the uh, live choir. And so the choir and the orchestra never performed together, so that in the end, when we're mixing in the studio, having things recorded individually like this allows us much more control over the final mix. I wanted to build around sort of this, the film style that I like to use, which is, you know, you have the orchestra, you have the choir, you have this mass of a hundred different people performing, and it just gives the music a weight and an importance that I think this game deserves. Most of the projects I work on, I get my inspiration from the visuals. And I get uh, a lot of inspiration from the people themselves who are creating the game. The, the game designers specifically said to me, or they explained the, the concept of destroyed beauty and how, you know, there, there are all the landscapes are very beautiful, but they've clearly been ravaged by war and by beasts, locusts, and all these things. And they wanted me to translate that into music. I can take a sound that's normally considered, you know, nice, pleasant sound, and 
destroy it, basically, run it through all kinds of... Right now we have a lot of cool technology, computers, and all kinds of effects you can play with and really create some unique sounds. A lot of times people's expectations are directly related to the amount of audio polish that is in the cinematics. You know, the better the audio sounds, the better the overall impression people have of the cinematic. Once we get our mocap actors together and get here in the mocap studio, I'll, um, I'll set the computer up. We'll start going through the scene, walking through the scene, see how the actors react to it and all. Not really, not as in like, wow, but it's just like, oh, so this is what they're trying to do type thing. In other words, you're kind of getting, you're gathering a lot of info from it. And we'll so, come yeah. in here, we'll work with them, we'll kind of walk through the scene a couple times, see where, yeah, we need to space this audio out a little more, this could be a little tighter, or hey, this guy would actually probably talk on top of what he's saying as, as a quick reaction. And we'll get all that timed out, and then we'll start working on the scene. We'll start working on, on doing a couple of takes on the scene. And start walking in. You're looking over the edge, seeing Nexus. And Dom, here comes your first line. I think we found our locust stronghold. Nexus. Here comes the next line. Now where do we find the queen? Well, I bet's on that tower in the middle. We're doing a few combat scenes, a few what we call walk and talk scenes, which are basically, we're just, we're blocking out um, dialogue scenes while we're walking and, and explaining the cinematics to the user. Barry, look over, and audio? We don't have the luxury of, of, of hitting a mark and saying a line and then moving on with another action. We have to time our motions to a pre-recorded voiceover. We don't have to worry about camera angles and, and that's, that's really liberating for an actor as far as not having to worry about, in, in film acting we have to have a, a sixth sense and, wor and worry about are we in close up, are we in a two shot, where, what, are we, what are we doing as far as where the camera is? Well in motion capture all of these cameras are picking us up at all times. So, at, once we finish shooting, they can, they can change the camera angle anywhere they want. In film acting, uh, you know, one of the old cliches is less is more. And it's, it, it comes across as very subtle. Um, here, I think it's a little bit more uh, similar to, to theater acting or, or acting in front of a live audience because we have to convey with our bodies exactly what's going on with this, that, that the, the voiceover actor is, is conveying within the scene. It's an incredible amount of fun playing Gus. Uh, you just, like I said, everything is 110% all the time. There's no lull with Gus, and it's just a, a lot of energy, a lot of impact. Uh, he's just a mean, big, tough guy uh, with the guns and everything, you know. So he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a bigger than life character. You grumpy ass bitches are going down, like way down, dead down, so down. You ain't gonna know which way is up. Your ass is gonna be crying to your stink queen, like, oh mommy, don't let the bad man hurt us, but we gonna whoop your mama's ass. <laughs> <laughs> So then after, after we've done the mocap process, all the animation is then targeted to the character skeletons. At that point, I'll take the animation, I'll start putting in the scene, we do what's called our layout phase. And the layout phase is basically where you're blocking the actors in the game world or in that level. And at that point, I can actually then go in, lay my cameras out, and start cutting the scene together based on, on the pace and the feel of it. The actual filmmaking happens in the layout process when you start seeing everything coming together. Certain designers are, are much more kind of book-based as far as, you know, having a, a tremendous process. And um, I have much more of a, almost a holistic uh, kind of feel-based approach. Uh, you know, start out with a few solid ideas and then iterate and, and try and, you know, find the, the bits of fun in the sandbox. And uh, we do this tremendously cool process of prototyping where we have these maps that are POC proof of concept. And uh, Lee Perry, uh, senior gameplay designer, I mean, and all the other team members, we'll sit down and we'll hash out what is the coolest possible stuff we can come up with. And then we, uh, you know, use the latest iteration of our technology to do rapid prototyping and uh, harvest the good ideas and throw away the bad. After we have the big idea, we sit down to shell out the level. And shelling out means just getting in there and, and in the editor and in simple, in simple terms blocking out what, what the general flow of the level is going to be. One of the things I absolutely love about the game is the flamethrower, uh, because it's a perfect example from a design side of something you've seen in other games before. You've, you've held 20 game, games in your hands with, with flamethrowers, and you ran around, you burned people left and right. <laughs> you add one element to the game, they, uh, being a cover system, for example, and you've never blind-fired a flamethrower. 
you've never reached around, slammed up behind something, and fired it around the cover. You've never, you've never used it in this way. You can look at something and say, oh, flamethrower, you know, whatever, that's not new. But it's about context and giving a player an experience with something that, that is new. Delta, hit those mortars! The primary thing we are trying to do here is just make Gears 2 feel more like a war rather than an insurgency or, you know, in Gears 1 you feel like it's just you and three guys kind of on your own mission outside of the COG, you know, outside of this army that you're fighting for. And so now what we're trying to do is reflect the larger story of, you know, this government trying to um, help its people survive this awful attack by these creatures who have come from underground. And so in the levels, what we're trying to do is make the battle feel bigger. We're trying to have more aircraft flying by and more trucks coming by and, and uh, more squads that you're going to run into as you're playing um, who can help you out or show you the way and that kind of thing. Just an overall sense of a bigger, larger scale war. But with Gears 2, we've got this foundation now of our, our core gameplay. We know what cover can be like. We know generally now how to lay out a level that is fun to fight in. So now with Gears 2, we can spend a lot more time on kind of creating unique variations on that gameplay within each level. Proportionately, the boss fights may be, you know, 15, 20 minutes total of the experience. It's a huge amount of what players will remember about the game. It's a huge amount of uh, adding character and setting and life to the big world. It's about the nuances of, okay, getting in cover here and cover slipping around here takes a third of a second too long. You've got you to gotta massage that out so it feels good. It doesn't matter what your game concept is, it's got to feel good to pick it up and control it. And when you pick up a game that does feel good, you know it immediately. <laughs> We have several new gameplay modes in multiplayer this time around. We have Horde, uh, which is co-op play, four or five of your buddies fighting against AI. <coughs> we have a new mode called Wingman, and this is basically two versus two versus two, two, two. And so it's ten guys fighting in pairs where just you and your buddy have to survive as long as you can. Normally when you're playing like Warzone, which is now five on five, there's five enemies for you to take out and you have four buddies that might also take out those enemies. Now in Wingman, I just have one friend and there's eight other guys that I can take out. And uh, the second you spawn in a Wingman match, you have to be careful and watch your six because people are running around and taking each other out from the get-go and it's tremendously exciting. We have another mode where you have to uh, it's similar to capture the flag, but this time the flag's actually alive and trying to kill you, and so you have to hunt this guy down and grab him and bring him back to your base in order to win. Most multiplayer games have a capture the flag game. It just doesn't really fit in the Gears universe. It'd be kind of, you know, weird to see Marcus Phoenix running around a map with a bright red flag or something. You know, that just seems weird. Um, but I could definitely see Marcus Phoenix dragging a body around and using it as a shield while he's fending off the enemy. The best part of this game mode is when both teams are just fighting it out, trying to get to this guy who doesn't care about either one of you. So the whole time he's running around killing everybody, he's you know, talking all kind of trash about how like, you know, he's owned you and this, that, and the other. And even when you're dragging, he's telling you that you stink. The progress we're making in so many different areas is really what's impressive to me and really shows the maturity and development of the team. You know, uh, our processes are much more refined this time around and allows us to spend a lot more time on it. The gameplay programmer just basically pulls everything together, uh, gets it together and so they can be placed in levels and uh, we, we definitely take an iterative approach to everything. So for a programmer that means taking an early idea, getting a rough prototype in, you may have no art assets at all, you know. The big boss creature could be a giant cube at that stage. And, uh, you know, get it in, get it working so we can start playing with it and, uh, you know, listen to people's feedback and offer suggestions and just keep iterating on that stuff. For Gears of War 2, we've taken the Unreal Engine 3 that we shipped with Gears 1 and we've added a whole lot of new features to it, uh, you know, to let the game designers go off in new directions with it. First of all, we've added a soft body physics system. Instead of just having rigid, rigid objects moving around, you can have squishy organic objects, which uh, really plays in very well into some of the new sorts of levels we're doing. There's also a destruction system. In Gears of War 1, when you shoot a wall, you see a bullet hole basically painted onto the wall. 
What we can do now is tear the wall apart and you see fragments go flying and you see a damaged, destroyed wall with actual chunks of geometry missing from it. Uh, so the new destruction system plays in really well with the Xbox 360's hardware capabilities to accelerate that. For Gears of War 2, we've really improved the character lighting model. So you see light bouncing around between the individual parts of the character. You also have much more lighting fidelity on characters, regardless of the light environment he's in. We've added a crowd system to the engine so that we can render a you know, hundred or more characters on the screen you know, and simulate gameplay on them and you know, build a real large-scale battle scene around that. Gears 1 was a, a highly visual game. It had some awesome graphics. And with Gears 2, we really want to continue that and raise the bar. We sit down with design, and they come up with a story arc and stories and characters and things like that. Um, and then what I do is I'll go back and we'll break that out and start concepting. I'll sit down with the concept artists and we'll say, hey, we need these creatures, such and such design wants them to behave this way. We'll do a, a back and forth and we'll widen, open the feedback loop up. We'll get design in on it. Hey, how's this working? How's that working? We'll riff with those guys and things will start coming together. The gore was a pretty big hit with everybody to where you had this very crazy, visceral experience. And so we wanted to build on that and expand that to the larger boss creatures and just have more of it without going way too over the top and making it completely gratuitous. To me, it's more about the context of what it is. It's not very slow, deliberate, creepy type of game. It's all in the heat of the battle and you're laughing and you're making fun and you're cracking jokes as you're, you know, punching your buddy in the face and as you've knocked him down or you're chainsawing him in half or something like that. Well, the guys are doing a fantastic job with the environments. Um, the artists, uh, the lighting, the, the, um, the size of the environments now, the fracture system, it's all there and it, it, uh, it's really pretty spectacular. On the Riftworm, for example, we have um, a lot of this uh, interior, fleshy, organic, really disgusting, you know, um, environments and, and Within that map, Marcus is chainsawing through arteries and hearts and all of this. And so what we actually did is, instead of using library sounds or anything like that, we did a custom Foley session where we actually went to the grocery store and bought a few hundred dollars worth of meat and chicken and macaroni and cheese and oatmeal, and we set up all of these different containers of different size and, and different types of combinations of sludge and meat. We actually just got messy in there, um, combining all of these things, stirring it up, throwing it against the wall, and um, yeah, mixing up macaroni and cheese. And uh, uh, a lot of those sounds were created completely um, from scratch from grocery store objects. Control! Delta here. We just... Uh... <coughs> uh, I don't know where to even begin, but uh, just get us the hell out of here. After the environment art gets done, it gets we, we dump everything into our editor. And then um, we have visual level designers. And they take the, um, the imported objects and they'll mesh out these levels and create these fantastic areas that just look great. And they'll, they'll also do a first lighting pass on, on some of the areas. Um, then gameplay will come in and they'll, uh, they'll go over that and, and start to play the game and make sure everything works. So once a level gets flushed out and we've got meshes in there and we've got gameplay in there and lighting and all that stuff, um, we'll do kind of a final pass and we'll, we'll start tweaking post-process and then we'll go over it and we'll have a punch list meeting and we'll say, hey, this, this is too dark, there's too much contrast, too, much, uh, too little color, too much color, yada yada. So we can adjust all that in the final polish phase. When everything's polished and looking great, that's, that's it. Gets locked down. Well, 17 years ago, Tim Sweeney started this company in his parents' basement in Maryland. And uh, 
Uh, about a year later, I joined the company. It was still in the basement. He still had that wicked cat that used to run around scratching everybody. Whereas I'd been programming since I was uh, 10 years old, and uh, that was really the thrilling part of my life, you know, to be able to write code and have a computer do exactly what, what you want. Um, and by the time I was about 24, I'd gotten really good at it. Um, so I wrote my first game, um, my first two little games, and released them as shareware. You know, we were doing everything back then. We were selling games uh, online. We were selling them over the phone. We were packaging up boxes. We were shipping them out. We were just starting. That was kind of one of my first roles in the company. It was just starting to get us into retail and do a little bit of marketing and PR and get people to know about us. When we released Unreal in 1998, that was when Epic really took off. When we made the original Unreal game, people started coming to us and asking if they could license the technology. When we came out later on with Unreal Tournament 2003, we were in full swing with the engine licensing, and obviously now there's so many games today using the same technology from Gears of War 2, which is Unreal Engine 3, that are using this technology and doing really great work with them. So I think that's been something that's been a real constant current of our company is what we've been doing with technology, and we've been getting better and better at the games and their content as well, obviously. There are a lot of things that Epic does you know, that require money and that require resources and things like that, but the most essential things we do are only possible because of the quality of the people we have here. So when you look at the scope of a team it takes to make a, a next-gen game, it's obviously large, whether you take in uh, you know, the core team here and the team at Microsoft that's working on it, or even outsourcing and, and partners, things like Epic Shanghai, who helped a lot with art, uh, you know, Technicolor, who did a lot of the VO recording and animation cleanup and facial animation. And, you know, like I said, there's uh, all of the people at Microsoft, both MGS and usability and playtest and all that stuff. I mean, it's, it it's becomes a rather large effort to make a AAA game. Shit, that was close. I am so glad to be out of there. Control, Delta here, we lost the queen. What I want the player to have experienced is the best polished, most fun shooter that he's played. And so I want it to be intense action, I want it to be exploration, I want there to be great story there. I want them to feel like they were an action hero and they had a starring part in this amazing experience. I think that's the, the golden moments for any design is when you can just get people excited about very specific events that just happened. They weren't scripted. There was just things that happened in a game. I want them to love the experience. I want them to go in there and just be like, this is hardcore. This is great. Um, I love this world. I love playing in this world. I love um, playing with these characters. Uh, I love the story, the, the experience, the art, everything. I just want them to come away really enjoying the experience. I want them to feel connected to the characters. I want them to care about Dom and what he just went through and to understand what's going on with the squad and realize there's more sort of pain here than, than just a, a marine killing, you know, uh, an enemy. We don't have any info after that. There's got to be another lead or, or something, I'm right? I'm sorry, Dom. There was something there. There was, a, there was something I connected to and had meaning for me and it caused me to pause for a second. If they get into the Gears world and they feel immersed and they feel a part of it and they feel like they, they take a part of the story with them, then, then that's cool, man. We've, we've done our job well. I want players who finish Gears of War 2 to be exhausted and have to go take a nap because they just had the roller coaster ride of their life.